welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Megan. Uh, Jerry Saltz is winner of the 2018 Pulitzer Prize in Criticism and two National Magazine Awards. He's the senior art critic at New York Magazine and its entertainment site, Vulture. Before joining New York in 2007, Saltz was senior art critic for The Village Voice since 1998 and was a twice Pulitzer Prize finalist during his tenure there. Jerry is a well-known social media user with over a million followers across platforms and a frequent guest lecturer at MoMA, the Guggenheim, the Whitney, and many others. Today, we're here to discuss his new book, How to Be an Artist. Please welcome Jerry Saltz. Hey, Megan. Hey, Hi. Google. Great to be here. We're so happy to have you. And, you know, I wanted to actually start, um, we're here to discuss how to be an artist, but I, I wanted everyone to get to know you a little bit. And you wrote, there it is. And you wrote a really amazing article that was highly personal and kind of an introduction to you, which was My Appetites, came out um, recently uh, in New York Mag. And through the lens of food, you kind of talk about your childhood, your art trucking days, and then eventually how you found criticism later in life. So I was wondering if you could just give us a short bio uh, to let people sort of know a little bit about your history and how you came to criticism uh, at a later point. Well, like everybody's story, in a way, Megan, I backed into my life accidentally on purpose. If you all think you're a big loser, you might be, but I'm a bigger loser. I have no degrees. I did not go to school. I didn't really start doing what I'm doing till I was 40 years old. I didn't become a weekly critic till I was 47. So that means if I were Megan, and she were me, which I wouldn't wish on anyone. It would mean that right now, Megan was a long distance truck driver with no degrees, totally cut off from the world and Jewish. So uh, my CB handle was Shalom Partner. Uh, I would deliver art because like I say, I'm Jewish and these were not 18 wheel trucks religion again, and uh, they were 10 wheel trucks, but I went to Florida and to Texas. And that's where I really, it's a, such a long story, but it's everybody's story. I was too afraid to do what I wanted, just like you, just like you listening, just like all of us, just like me this morning, I'm sitting here surrounded with all these notes I have to write uh, on an article and my demons then and now say to me, you can't do this. You don't know what you're doing. You're a fake. You have a bad neck. You're not tall enough. You're not rich enough. You didn't go to the right school. And when I was young, I listened to those demons, Megan, and I self exiled. And it wasn't until I was in my forties that I just thought anything is better than this. And I, out of nowhere, just called myself, which is what I want everyone listening here to do. I called myself what I now decided I would try to be. So if you wanna be a dancer, a photographer, a screenwriter, a poet, uh, a cook, whatever you want to be. I walked into parties and they'd say, what do you do? And I go, mm, I'm an art critic. And then of course comes the hard work <laughs> of having to do it. But anyway, I invented myself much the way Megan is right now inventing herself. She's kind of a genius. I met her when she was a kid apprenticing for one of the greatest curators in the United States back in Chicago. So I don't know who she's going to be yet. Me either. So thank you, Jerry. I appreciate that because that gives me hope for my future. But I do love working at Google right now. So I, I do I do want to turn uh, to the, the book a little bit. You wrote a magazine article at the end of 2018. It was called How to Be an Artist. And it had 33 rules or pieces of advice. And then you sort of turned this into to a book. Can you give us a little bit of... 
uh, the transition from the article to, to the book and how that happened? The article was some sort of runaway success, I'm told. There's hundreds of thousands of people clicked on it. They stayed on it. They kept commenting. And as anybody that follows me at Jerry Saltz at, uh, I would recommend Instagram. That's my strongest game. As anyone knows, I will answer every one of you back. And I'm never that mean. I'm a pretty nice guy. It'll be quick, a little gnomic, a little sassy, but you will not get hurt or embarrassed. Um, and other people kept saying, and the second I finished the article about how to be an artist, which I would say I could never write a book called How to Be a Critic. I would love to read How to Be What I Am because I don't self-identify as a critic. I self-identify as a sort of folk artist or if you know who Sister Wendy or Bob Ross was. In any event, I wrote this little short book of about 75 short one page rules and ideas, not to become rich and famous, Megan, as an artist, but how to have what I wanted to have, what you are having, what most of you listening would like to know what that's like, which is have a life lived in art. And it's sort of a note to my younger self that left art and then it's like what I would want to have known then that I now know and that I've learned from every artist I've ever met. And I just wanted to put that all down in a book in a real simple, accessible way that basically says to people, look, the minute you sit down to work, I promise you, you're going to be really embarrassed. It's a nightmare because every time you start to become more of yourself in public, it's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed right now. It's unbearable, but we try. And the book is about learning to accept that embarrassment, getting lost, and really, you big babies, getting to work. You have to get to work. I know it's hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for Megan. It's hard for you. The only cure for work block, I'm afraid, and I've tried hundreds of them, is work. Work comes from work. And if you work, my loves, I promise you, along with being embarrassed, you are now taking your first beautiful baby steps to knowing what life is as a creative person and thinking in new ways of art is a way of understanding the world or writing or sewing or whatever the act is that you all want to do. And now is the time to be trying it right now during coronavirus. We're living in a revolution. This is your moment. That's such an awesome overview, and I want to dig in on some of this. So to, so to start, you, you were an artist. You had an artist-run gallery. Do you still make art? Do you miss it? What kind of art did you make? I was an artist until, again, the demons spoke to me the same way they're speaking to everybody out there right now. And unfortunately, I listen. I don't want you guys to listen. They never no reason to listen to them today and they're almost always wrong anyway so what you may know you be you might not be any good i might not be any good whatever that's irrelevant it isn't about good and bad it's just about making something in your own voice so i was an artist i quit making art and it was very painful because it was physically, psychically, metaphysically, so amazing to live in that space. And I even had success. So those of you saying, well, if I were successful, I no, I'm telling you, I'm successful. I'm quote famous. 
And I have bad mornings every morning too. Th that doesn't change anything. It's fun. So somebody goes, hey, Jerry. And I go, hey, Megan. And I don't know who I'm talking to and, and it's all good. But I guess what I want people to understand most of all is if they will just get to work, something will come of it. I promise you, I absolutely promise as you're listening now, if you work a little every day, you're gonna be successful. I think that is so universal no matter what field you're in. Um, one, one question I sort of had was, do you know, did you get the question of how to be an artist a lot? You just said you, you wouldn't write a book on how to be a critic. Would you write a book on how to be a collector? Would you write a book on how to be a viewer? Um, but how did you, how, you, you said there were so many people asking you how to be an artist, but in all sorts of different ways. And you distilled it down so simply. As I said, the book is like little chapters. Just each page has an idea. Like this one happened to say, except that you might be poor. The other one says, define success. Let's just look at that. Look, we all talk about all the artists that make money, but the truth is about 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of all artists make gobs and barrels of money. Of course, the art world that Megan and I dwell in that we obsess over those 55 mostly white male artists. So we get jealous, we hate them, we read about their lifestyles, the whole thing. But 99.9% .9 of us are not making that much money. And the minute you begin to sort of accept that, you'll see that if you then, as the book goes on, to talk about define success, how big is the audience that you need? Does it have to be 30 million, 40 million? Look, each one of us are little crazy preachers or shamans that live on the edge of a village and we're smelly and we talk to ourselves and we make things that we tell ourselves that other people need. And then we try to preach to our little congregations our truth. And for if you accept my bad, dumb, idiot truth, this will offer you redemption or salvation or something beauty. All art, in a way, Megan is saying, I see you looking at me. I saw you from across the room. Come closer. Come closer. You're interested in me. And I'm interested in you being interested in me. Come closer. I love you. You love me. I mean, it's some crazy shit here. But each of us only needs to convince a handful of people to accept us. If you're an artist or a dancer or a photographer or a writer, you really only need, say, one dealer or publisher. That's one person to accept you. And then how about money? You might only need, if you're an artist, about five or six collectors who will stick with you through the good times and the bad, when things are tough and when you're making crapola, which we all make, but we don't know it sometimes, you might need two critics. You're up to about nine people. For God's sake, you can pull the wool over the eyes of 12 people. I have, Megan has over there at, at Google. If you can just fake 12 people up, to pay you some crap amount of money that you wouldn't make anyway, that you'll begin to have a life lived in art and you'll be happy. I love that. So, so we, when we're talking about the goal of this book, you've mentioned a couple of things. It only takes a certain number of people in your village. Um, but the goal of this book, who is this intended for? Is this intended only for people who want to become professional artists? Is this intended for anyone in a creative field. Tell us a little bit about the goal you had when writing this book and who the audience was. 
I'm sorry I didn't say that, uh, Megan, that is important to me. It's really not for the super professional who has an MFA and a PhD in art. This is for everyone else. All the people that have an inkling, a sense that they have something they might want to say or do or make or join or be a part of, but for some reason think they can't or they're not educated enough. Let me tell you, education is something you do for yourself. If you're going to be in the art world, you just look, you look, you look, and you keep looking. If you're in any world, this book is for you to gain sort of the secret languages of a world that you might want to enter from the inside. I just happened to turn to another one that just says, have courage. It's about the obstinance, the will, the ability to go to the 3 a.m. that comes every night, the dark night of your creative self that goes, you can't do this. The main piece of advice I have for all of you, if you really want to know the truth, a couple of things. Make an enemy today of envy. You've got to stop looking out at what everyone else has and telling yourself, she has more, he's better, he has the gift of gab. I don't really know what I'm talking about. The truth is you are then in the service of those people. Make an enemy of envy because it only eats your art away from the inside. Get to work, you big babies. Be willing to be embarrassed, like I said. I, I think you should start an advice column, Jerry. And, That's what I think you should do. Have courage and then Stay up late, my loves, every night with other vampires, other vampires like you. That means in your world, if you're in Megan's world or my world, or if you want to be in dance or whatever you do, even during coronavirus, be in contact with others that speak your language and that know what you're trying to get at that will also be your first best critics. The ones that won't just blow smoke up your butt and go, it's all good, Megan. Everything you do is good, honey. No, that's the person you want to get is closer to you that goes, this is really good, but I think you haven't really thought this one through, Megan. Those are the people you need. Form a little vampire coven, coven, and you'll do it. I promise you, you can take over the world that way. It's going on in the streets as we speak, where all these vampire covens, covens, have now gotten together. And it turns out that the languages that they were developing in private for the last five or 10 years, they all have a lot in common. In this case, it's like enough with racism. This isn't about left and right. This is about right and wrong. And clearly a revolution is taking place right now. And you younger people, especially, Anybody below my age, I'm 69, this is your world now. It's completely your world. Take it. It's yours. Remake it. I love that. I think one of the things that um, that I always love about you and your work is that you sort of take the snooty art world and you make it accessible for so many people. That is so brilliant, Jerry. And you, one thing that you talk about, and I, I saw kind of a thread through this book, is about art needing to speak for itself, about it not having to have tons of context. You just, you said it so beautifully before when you talked about the relationship when you're looking at a painting about coming toward each other. Um, and I think that there's there's a parallel with technology because if you have a good user interface, it speaks for itself. You don't need an instruction manual, right? And I think that you've sort of said that with art too. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about being about art in it, in its own way, speaking for itself and being intuitive and why that's important. Megan is really right, listeners. 
We do not listen to a Mozart and ask, what does it mean? We don't listen to Abba and ask, what does that mean? That would be misunderstanding it completely. Like she just said, listening, uh, uh, using an interface should be like almost second nature as the first time you're doing it. Too much art right now requires long pages of explanatory notes that only the mandarins who write this gobbledygook understand in the first place and that that language is used to keep too many people out i'm interested in a user over uh, interface that is almost comes to you with what Emerson called an alienated nature. Let, let me go into this a little bit because I'm out there on the edge of the idea. Let me go in. <clears throat> Art is one of the oldest and most effective operating systems our species has ever come up with to examine consciousness, the visible world, the invisible world, each other, ourselves, anything. It was there in the cave walls. It was there when we were Neanderthal, made beautiful, decorated and painted hand stone axes one million years before humanoids even existed. They had fire. They had a material culture where they traded material, pigment, flints, stones, things to carry things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The operating system of art is so effective and porous and large that it hasn't died. Its interface, if you will, is still very usable, but we've narrowed it down to where only certain people are supposed to be practicing it. It's only supposed to be shown in a certain way, written about in a certain way. I want you to follow me on Instagram at Jerry Saltz, and then see that art is as accessible as Abba, is as open as an Indian Raga, as is there for you as you are for it, that it doesn't have to be that complicated. And yet you can make art about the most complicated, weird ass things in the world. And I promise you, you can get an audience of at least 12, maybe, maybe 112, and you'll become a little preacher of your own. Start it now during coronavirus. Now is the time in your cave to get to work. I think everyone on this, you know, I'm reading the log comments. I think you are giving everyone the pep talk that they absolutely need. I love the listicle format of this book. We, we've talked about it short, pithy. Um, your your words really do resonate. One thing you you add in this book are exercises. Now, I'm someone who loves structure. So that really does speak to me. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, like, do even creative people, sometimes they need a little bit of direction to get started. And maybe you can talk about a few of the exercises that you've, that you've put in this book. Again, the first exercise is butt in chair, get up, yell back at the refrigerator, even though it's telling you to eat food, stop scrolling your Twitter for at least 10 seconds and put your butt in a chair and get to work. Let's just say you want to draw. What I would suggest is just draw whatever is in the square foot in front of you. Draw it once, draw it twice, draw it a thousand times, draw Nana across the room or your dog. I'm not interested in you ever being able to draw as good as Michelangelo or Rembrandt or anybody. You have to understand, Van Gogh 
is self-taught. Van Gogh drew the worst, ugliest drawings in the world until he found a way to draw like Van Gogh. He's an annoying Dutch religious guy. He goes to Paris. He's the most famous artist alive, not the big lie that he's unknown, because he's been drawing and painting in a way that all the other artists around him understood that he was doing something important. I can explain what that is later if people want to know. The point is to draw, to do the exercises that Megan is talking about that I have in this book in your own voice. That's all I'm interested in. Do your little dance for Instagram and post it. It will be horrifying, but in that little dance, you will see something that you think, that wasn't bad. And then you use that to do the next thing and the next thing. And you stop thinking about, is it good? Is it bad? That is irrelevant. Who cares what you think if it's good or bad or what others think? You will not be defined by rejection, your own or others. That is for accountants. That's for clerks that somebody comes and goes, this didn't add up the right way, Miss Megan. Forget that. This is your world. Put a sign over your door that says reality ends here or reality begins here. I don't care. That's what your world is. Make your own exercises. Do them. Post them, you big babies. And people will start to see how you see. It isn't that hard, and it's really kind of fun and sexy. I think everyone's going to go make art after this. I, I, you know, be, beyond the exercises, you have amazing, you have amazing quotes, anecdotes, paintings in the book. I mean, the the book is like a little art history manual. That's amazing. So I was, I was curious, sort of, how did you balance sort of picking out those, uh, those, those images to punctuate the book? I know you have. Uh, quoted some of Roberta, your wife, uh, in the book, which I think is, is very sweet. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you brought in those elements to, to the listicle. First of all, I'm married to Roberta Smith, who's the co-chief art critic of the New York Times. I love my work <clears throat> as an art critic. I doubt it, just like you doubt your work, everybody. But I do love it underneath. I'm just as deluded as all of you that I think maybe it's good. But truly, I think Roberta is the greatest art critic alive. And I'm really lucky that we got together when I was a long distance truck driver. How that happened, I will never know. I, don't, I barely had hair then, just a huge loser. I was single at the time, so was she. And I do quote her, and I really think people should read Roberta Smith as a great first primer to understanding art. The way I pick the pictures, Megan, to go in this book, I just happened to open a page. There's um, a, a Francis Bacon and a Michelangelo's David maybe the most famous sculpture ever made. I wanted to take the really well-known things that you might not know how to approach and talk about that. Like, what do you see when you see an exploding Pope of Francis Bacon? What is the deeper content of Michelangelo's noble David, naked with the teeny weeny, looking off into the distance. I get into all that. It's good stuff. <laughs> it is good stuff. Um, I'm going to invite everyone to leave uh, questions in the, the live chat um, so that we can post them. But I'm going to ask one more question first before we do that. Jerry loves audience questions. You know, the thing that you do and do so well is you talk about art. Um, you said you say things like let yourself be a Philistine. Take away the pretense. Art is for, uh, is for anyone, but not for everyone. How can you help people? You know, I think you gave us some clues about how to engage, but when we're looking at art and talking about art, how, how do you recommend that, that 
that people who have never had any real exposure um, can go about it and not feel like it's um, it, it's so difficult and and such a uh, something so inaccessible to them. Right. I remember that I have no art history that I taught myself just by looking. I have no special gifts. The first thing I would ask you to do is put aside good and bad, okay? You already know the second you look at like an all white painting or Francis Bacon's exploding Pope, you have a sense if this is for you or not. You have to put that aside and then ask, what would I like about this painting if I were the kind of person that liked this painting and really get quiet inside and allow yourself to make a short list, very simple of, oh, the colors are kind of garish. The expression seems to have a certain rage in it. It seems to be the person who made this has a real beef against organized religion even though I hate this painting. You've already have picked up three very deep skeleton keys to a very complex work. Or an all white painting, you might go, well, is every stroke the same length? Is the paint even? Is the person who made this making it from a I hate art or I want art? to see what more art can be. You start making these little lists. You start noticing what you like and then what you don't for those reasons. Then talk to other people in any gallery or museum you're in. Without being a creep, especially men, I would recommend turning to the person on your left or right and just saying, what do you see in this? Not in a snotty way, but in a curious way, your mind will be blown. I do this online every day and my mind is blown by what people see in the biggest crap I've ever seen. It changes my mind every day and it opens me and it will open you more and more and more and more until you're like a, a river just flowing with possible things to use. And it doesn't take long to unleash the floodgates. I promise you, if you just stay open and get to work, you big babies. I love that. I would love to take an audience question right now if we have one. Okay, so this is from Odalena Kostova. What is your view on balancing between monetizing art and keeping your creative spark? I feel it, difficult. I find it difficult to see my art as a job. It becomes less fun immediately. Art is calling. Art is you is a, I think I'm going to I'm an ex hippie. I think art is part of a universal force that is using us to replicate itself. I know that sounds weird, but anybody who makes anything, Megan, you, Odalina, everyone has that funny feeling of, where did that come from? I did not know I was going to say or do or make that before I made it. Bob Dylan has talked about, it's like there's a ghost that occupies you. I would say that except that you must sit down in that professional way to make what you're going to make. You've got to get that close to sitting down to writing your bad song. But then just surrender and just use whatever comes to you without judging it every single second. You'll get there. She's right. All right. How about another audience question? From Vishal Paul. How do we balance art and our other responsibilities, work, health, relationships, sleep, et cetera? Right now in coronavirus lockdown, you are in the exact conditions that art was made in, in for the last 75,000 years. That means in a smaller place, in more intimate conditions, 
out of materials that are at hand, whatever's around you. You're not going out and working in a big shop. Nana is in the background cooking. Uh, the kids are next door. You're exhausted from homeschooling. But like I say, 99.9% .9 of all the things ever made in our by our species were made in this condition, in the caves, in small rooms, in intimate settings by only one hand. Is there a balance? I don't know how to strike that balance because I'm obsessed with a few things. One of them happens to be art. The other is trying to tell people my ideas, whatever I'm an idiot and want other people to know. So as much as I hate writing, that's my other obsession. I would say, don't worry about balance. There is no balance. There is only love and do what you can do. Do it as well as you can. Awesome. All right, should we take one more? From Dean Dang. What about the importance, what about the importance of art education? Agreed that art should speak for itself, but I've also found that art can become more meaningful by learning about the context and intention behind a piece. You cannot go wrong by trying to learn more about the context of the work. Of course, it's wonderful to know that uh, a Byzantine icon was used as a prayer or to cast a spell or to get you pregnant or to stop you from getting pregnant or to protect an army or a village or that you cut off the sacred foreskin of Jesus to protect the city of Ravenna. All of that is icing on the metaphysical cake. However, I would argue that when you look at a Greek vase or hieroglyphics in the, in the desert, that there's a very deep form and content that will echo and through that even if you don't quite know the context, like an Indian raga, again, or Japanese violins, or a gamelan orchestra, that you begin to acclimate those inner architectures and they become yours. When I read the Iliad, maybe I don't make sacrifices of oxen, but I begin to understand the nature of sacrificing and what that could mean to know an animal well, to have raised that oxen myself, to have given it a name, to know its personality, to understand what's at stake if when I slit its throat and offer up its blood to the gods for my children. Those things can become known to you with more context, but with no context, you can also access them. I would just say, Again, over and over, open yourself. Stop worrying if you understand it. Ugh, who cares <laughs> if you understand it? I don't understand anything that I see. Ask any artist, what does it mean? They often go, I'm not really sure. I just had this idea that I wanted to do something about a cube. Who the hell knows what they're talking about? They talk like shamans or crazy people because we're all half mad when we make something. Just accept that. Agreed. I'm, I'm going to take it back for one second. I do want to talk about the elephant in the room, which is COVID and the art world. And, you know, what your thoughts are right now on the role of galleries, how this has affected your writing, um, and how do you see this, you know, sh actually shifting um, the art world? COVID, the meaning of the word catastrophe, it's an ancient, it's a Greek word. It means overturning. It means the arrival of pain and change on the stage. We are living in a catastrophe. 
catastrophes reveal fault lines that were in the play, that were in a system long before catastrophe arrived. We are very well with Black Lives Matter that obviously that was a system that was severely, you know, rotted. And so again, somebody finally tapped it and the dam broke. Coronavirus has done the same with our healthcare systems, with our society, with politics, with economics, with everything. But now we come to Megan's question. What about our tiny, say, two million person art world? Well, it immediately revealed the cracks in the infrastructure that were already there, okay? The art world had become, it had answered every question with the same two answers. It got bigger and it got busier. So it became normal for people like Megan or art dealers to fly to London to go to a museum show. Well, she didn't get to do this, but it became normal for the art world to fly to London for a museum show and return that night. It became normal to go to Basel Art Fair and then fly to Torino and then fly to Paris for a museum show and then go to Hong Kong for another art fair and then make a studio visit in Shanghai. It became normal for our galleries to become almost like death stars and become so huge that they sucked up all of the artists from the entire middle tier. All of that, my loves is gone. Will it come back? I don't think so. Certainly not the traveling. Once upon a time in the 1990s, I was lucky. I built an artwork. Along with a million or two other people, I built a big, beautiful, new art world after two giant recessions and AIDS had decimated the art world, its creative ranks, and our, politically we had become so radical that we were on the outside for good. Those were the perfect conditions to create a new art world that grew, was beautiful, and then got big and busy and ugly. You all listening to this, batons are being passed. You are being tasked with building a new art world. A, with an art world, with an infrastructure of compassion, of comfort, of community, of agency. The art world I built was beautiful and good, but it didn't have those things. It was open, but not open enough. Mm -hmm. Yours will be open. The canon was already being stripped and torn down. Now the canon is blown apart. It doesn't mean that Picasso is off limits. He's mm -hmm. pretty good. If you kids want to throw him out, I can't stop you, but it's time. 51% of the population is female. 51% of the artists allowed in could be female. There'll be mediocrity, but there's been 50,000 years of mediocre white male artists. Surely we can begin to sort through the mediocre women, black artists, Latina, etc. We can do this, and it's your job. I may never set foot, having never gained immunity, because I'm old back into your art world. I will love you from afar. I can write about you from here until there's no more need for my work. But now, during coronavirus, and viruses come, but viruses go. They always go. In 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, I don't know how many months, you will be, the art world is yours. I may never set foot in it. 
you ask me what's going on now, the answer is, you tell me what's going on now. It's just like the movie Apocalypse Now, when you're chasing somebody to the other side into Cambodia, and you realize the old order you once knew, it's already gone. It's already gone. The world, that world is gone. Well, Terry, I sincerely hope to see you're a pillar of uh, the art world. I love seeing you out and about, and I truly hope that we're able to do that again in the in the near future. So that is my hope. But you know, sort of as a follow up, you know, technology. Um, you know, there's all these online fairs now. There's you're writing about art online. What do you think that takes away? Like, what's the difference between seeing an artwork in person versus this new digital world? And is anything good coming of it? Like uh, maybe transparency in prices, or or giving more people who aren't able. You mentioned travel. Travel was a big part of the art world. Now, all of a sudden, you don't have to travel. You can live in one country and you can see, you know, an artist in Romania, right? So, so what good is coming out of this that we might want to keep? That's a beautiful question. First, there's two sides. One is local, local, local. Right now, since there won't be that much travel, your little art world, wherever you are, whatever city, and you need to be around other artists, even if it's online, whatever small group you're involved in, those are the people that are really important to you now. Those audiences, those critics, writers, collectors, galleries, museums, dance halls, whatever. But Megan is asking a really important question. What about? I am too old to have ever had sex online, but people do it. So if you can have sex online, for God's sake, I'm sure you can look at art online and have an okay time of it. Is it as good as it is in person? You tell me. You're the people out there doing it both ways. I think I would rather see and have preached a lifetime of seeing art in the flesh. Yet, I love Japan, and I've never been to Japan. I love Antarctica and Australia, and have never been there. So Megan is right. Right now... If these antenna can intertwine and have, you know, aesthetic sex and transfer and energy that way, I'm good with that. It's all on you. As an old person, I still have never, no one ever taught Roberta and I how to do the Netflix. We're six generations behind you. All I can say is use whatever tool you have, any tool you have to connect that's that's beautiful why don't we take another question from the audience from uh Val valeria volpe how do you pick an idea to focus on instead of flirting with so many ideas and not giving any one of them enough time to develop right valeria boy every time i pick up a book i don't know if you have this i read it for three pages and think Oh my God, I should be reading a different book. That book seems like maybe it's the important one. No, this one, it's hard. As an artist, I can only say to you, get your ass in the chair, sit down and work for 20 minutes. Can you do that? See if 20 minutes with an idea will start to yield something. If it doesn't, maybe start again. When I'm going to write on something, it's a bit, it is like that flirtation. What is flirtation? It's in a way when you feel the hit of little fish on your line hitting the bait and you feel a weird electric charge like, oh, there's something about this that's really garish or ugly or bad or good or beautiful. Start to try to reel that in. And again, I said it before, get quiet inside. Calm the critical fucking voices and see what's there for you. You never know what you're going to make until you start to make it. Try everything and don't get stuck on just one thing. I'll slap your hand. Very bad. Very bad if you do that. Um, so... Which will be, we'll do one more audience question and then I'll take it back for, for a minute. 
if that's possible. From Arash, can art flourish without an artist? Meaning how much of art and its reception influence is dependent on the artist and their ability to advocate uh, for or champion their art? Our uh, what was the name, Arish? Arash. Ara. A really good question. Here's the thing. You are your best advocate. You are absolutely right. If you're not going to speak up and stand up for your work, and I don't care, people, when you say, well, I don't know how to talk about my work. Sorry, you better keep it simple, stupid. That's my first piece of recommendation. Don't talk about I'm trying to re resolve the Marxian dialectic between nature and culture. Everybody will start getting sleepy. Just say whatever you're thinking. Like I woke up and I'm interested in magic tricks or driving with my eyes closed. That was my dream, blah, blah, blah. Keep it simple, stupid. But once your art is out in the world, my darlings, Without you, like my work goes out every day, it's on its own. And then it takes on a new life. Let me very briefly just tell you that your Hamlet and my Hamlet are different. And my Hamlet is different every time I see it. That's how great, great art can be. That it's never the same when you look at it. A Norman Rockwell is good, but it's always the same when you look at it. A Cy Twombly, that's a really scribbly, crazy, abstract artist. It's maybe weird, but it's different every time you look at it. I love that. Um, so let's talk about, I want to turn a little bit. You mentioned your social media. Your social media is amazing. Um, you've really like used it to reach a whole new audience. It's a bit irreverent. Um, how how did you come to understand the value of these platforms? And can you talk a little bit about how you think the art world has sort of shifted to these platforms and what it's done, like especially, you know, an Instagram or something along those lines? I never wrote in an authoritative voice, Megan. You can tell how I talk. It's just not in my nature. And yet criticism has always been from the top down from the one to the many. Yep. Social media, very early on as a late adapter, I understood about eight years ago that instead of the one speaking down to the many, if you use social media, you could have the many speaking to one another. And that seemed important to me. I started putting short reviews in five, 10 sentences online and with a picture. And then I decided whenever I was nervous and I couldn't write and I would look at my Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, I would answer back each person, even if they were saying, Jerry Saltz is an asshole for liking Francis Bacon. I would write back, dear Mr. or Ms. Juju69, I'm sorry you think I'm an asshole, but so I found a way to have us all talk to each other. It's interesting that I used to be on those top 100 power lists of the art world, but was warned very publicly on those lists. If he keeps practicing art criticism online, he won't be an art critic anymore. And I right away thought, well, screw that. You might not call me an art critic. I don't care what you call me but I'm going to practice whatever this is online. I don't want art to have so many secret handshakes. Mm -hmm. It didn't in the past. The front of a Gothic cathedral was meant as a book for people that could not and never were taught to read. That's what universe my mind is no more or less important than religion, psychology, philosophy, economics, anything. Mm. Art is not the decorative hedge in front of the citadel of knowledge. It's part of the whole ball of wax. Mm. So Beautifully said. Please come online and follow me, you big babies. And on your own Instagrams and Twitters and Facebooks, can I give a little bit of advice here? 
listen to me, listen. Post your own work, but don't only post your own work. Post things that interest you, weird things you see. Post other people's work, you egomaniacs. Things that you like. No plates of food, preferably no dogs. Children are okay. They're fine. I hate them, but I think that all artists are, should have kids. It's great. It helps <laughs> you work. It might ruin your life, but it'll help you work. So post shit online. Be a little radically vulnerable. I am. You'll be embarrassed. It won't hurt. And even a loser like me can end up with one million followers. I don't know how to make it make money, but I got this Instagram and I learned how to make it talk. All right, last quick question. What do you think the role of corporations in the art world should be? You know, if we're specifically here, we are at Google. What do you think about artist residencies? What do you think is uh, the responsibility of, of corporate America in the art world? More, 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 more. You can be the Catholic Church, Google. Every corporation is the Catholic Church. Real estate is decimated. Give all your goddamn square footage to your tired, your weak, your poor. They can't rent it out anyway anymore. So start renting it for cheap. Listen, it's your job as artists to learn how to steal the money from the Google people, okay? Or from every corporation or every residency. That's your job. It's always been your job. It's not that hard to act like an idiot shaman and talk Megan into like a, a six week residency. She's as game as I am. She's a great eye. Just approach Google with your stupid idea and don't always go, well, I need uh, $112,000 to build the <laughs> sculpture in back of the Brooklyn Museum. Screw you. Build it out of foam, out of styrofoam, out of cardboard and propose it, okay? Don't be such a, you know, uh, special. The world doesn't owe anybody a living. I'm sorry if you weren't born rich. She wasn't, I wasn't, we're resentful, but we go on with it. Get on with it, you big babies. And corporations, I don't care if you're virtue signaling or what you're doing, just build it and they will come. Build it now. You are the richest corporations and companies on earth and even the poor ones. We pretend we like you, you pretend you like us, we get together, we use each other. It's fabulous. Gary, you are an absolute delight. Everyone, yeah. please, please go out and get your copy of How to Be an Artist. Please. Has wonderful advice. Um, and we cannot thank you enough for being here with us today. And we look forward to seeing you back on the streets of New York in the art world. I feel the same about all of you. Go have a life lived in art. I love you all. Make work tomorrow. No, make work today.